The American Civil War had just ended, and the US Navy, with a brief stint as the Union Navy, had gone from a small force of wooden frigates to a navy equipped, albeit briefly thanks to budget cuts, with large numbers of a new kind of warship, the turret equipped Monitor. The appearance of this design had sparked off a wave of similar vessels across the naval world, both for coastal and river work, with a few other ocean-going vessels like Huascar taking inspiration from the idea of a small turret-armoured vessel, but being more of a halfway house between a ship and a monitor. The fundamental problem in making an ocean-going monitor was the low freeboard, which could easily lead to a vessel being swamped, and even if it wasn't, it would make living conditions intolerable after a short period of time. All of this would come to a head, at least in the British Empire, in 1866, when the colony of Victoria, in what is now Australia, wanted a ship to defend Melbourne. The need to only conduct harbour defence, and the limited budget, meant that a small compact design of monitor was thought the best way to fill this need. The only problem was that the ship would need to be built in the UK, which meant it also had to be capable of crossing multiple oceans to get to its new home. At first, the Admiralty wanted nothing to do with it, believing that it wasn't actually possible to make a ship watertight enough to endure the length of the voyage down the Atlantic and then across the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean, whilst you know still being a monitor at heart. But eventually they were persuaded to try. Now the chief constructor, Edward Reed, drew up plans, but they were somewhat different to Ericsson's original monitors, which you all know from the American Civil War. He saw the funnels, air inlets and turret bases as flooding risks, and whilst the main hull of the ship was a typical monitor-style raft with only three and a half foot of freeboard, he also had an armoured breastwork constructed amidships, atop which the turrets, funnels, vents and a small superstructure could be placed, and this breastwork raised all of these potential ingress points for water to ten and a half feet above the sea. The ship would be named Cerberus, and displaced a little over 3,300 tonnes, and apart from the superstructure, which effectively contained the bridge and provisions for the boats, and that was about it, she was covered in varying thicknesses of armour. The hull had an 8-inch belt amidships, narrowing to 6 inches at each end, and the belt ran the full length of the ship. The breastwork itself was generally protected by 8 inches of armour, which increased to 9 inches beneath the turrets, and the turrets themselves were also 9 inches thick, which increased to 10 inches to armour the area around the guns. All the armour plate was backed by varying thicknesses of teak. Her armament consisted of four 18-ton, 10-inch muzzle-loading rifles in a pair of twin turrets, one fore and one aft, and that would be all for a while, although later on some Nordenfeldt machine guns would be added up on top, the top of the superstructure. Propulsion was provided by 1,370 indicated horsepower, which powered two screws, which could get the ship up to a stately speed of just under 10 knots. But for all that, the ship would actually prove to be surprisingly agile. Laid down in 1867 and launched in 1868, she was completed in 1870 at the cost of £117,556. Initially she had two pole masts fitted, one fore and one aft, but in view of her delivery voyage, after a nasty run-in with a gale, a further large but temporary unarmoured breastwork was constructed, which blended in with the existing one but also carried all the way fore and aft, increasing her overall freeboard to around 20 feet, which along with a temporary three-mast sailing rig would see her safely through some truly worrying weather systems to her Antipodean home. Once there, she was of course not intended to stray beyond Melbourne except for gunnery practice, and so these measures were removed, along with some of the extended superstructure elements that stored boats over the turrets and the pole masts, which somebody had noticed were likely to get blown apart by shot or shockwave should the ship ever find itself needing to fire directly fore or aft. Instead, a single pole mast was installed amidships behind the funnel. 
although they were kind enough not to mount any kind of spotting position in the middle of the funnel's exhaust stream, something that future designers of British warships might well have benefited from paying attention to. Here, HMVS Cerberus would stay, assuming flagship duties of the Victorian Navy in April 1871, gradually accreting upgrades like the aforementioned machine guns, as well as torpedo nets plus 57mm and 3-inch quick-firing guns during the 1890s. By the time the various colonies became Australia in 1901, she had already been downrated to a store ship, but she was still technically in active service in 1911, when the Royal Australian Navy evolved from the intermediate Commonwealth Naval Forces, and thus she became HMAS Cerberus. She would gradually degrade over the 1910s, briefly becoming a submarine tender in the early 1920s, before being decommissioned and sold for scrap in 1924. However, her story didn't end there. Instead of going to the breakers, she was instead stripped of all resaleable material that they could physically move, and then scuttled for use as a breakwater. What's left of her is still there today, albeit in a gradually decaying state in spite of some rather valiant preservation efforts. What the future holds for the ship remains, as yet, unwritten. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.